talk about in the next 30, 35 minutes uh, is sort of matching the tactics to the objectives, the opportunities that you have, your time and your budget. Um, hopefully at the end of this you walk away with a clear idea of what kind of tactics make most sense for your agency, whether you engage Confluency to do things for you, you use another vendor, or you do things in-house, you'll have a better idea about which tactics are the best match for you. The, uh, the second webinar, Digital Marketing for Maximum Customer Value, so really kind of developing your book of business, uh, that's going to be the focus. That's scheduled now for October 21st, also at 2 p.m. The sign-up link for that webinar will be sent out to you with the, the follow-up email. Webinars three and four, green growth and digital marketing, and then how to make digital marketing part of everyone's job description. Those will be uh, scheduled probably between, you know, that obviously the October 21st date, but probably early November, mid-November is when we'll, uh, we'll be holding those. Okay, so selecting the right tactics, matching those things with your objectives, your opportunity, and your budget. And this was the agenda that we had sent out and it was also on the sign-up page. There's a number of different things we're going to cover fairly quickly. Um, you know, how far have we really come from the old days, the yellow page paradigm? Top, we're going to look at a top-down, bottom-up cap analysis. A lot of you are probably familiar with that approach. We'll have a spreadsheet for that. Matching the communication channel to your target. Who are you selling to? And that's, that's going to be different for each of you. Uh, we'll look at some low-hanging fruit, both in the customer uh, growth area, kind of the developing your book of business, as well as the green growth area. So a couple of other, couple of other options and ROI considerations, and then uh, mixing things together, uh, sort of how do you how do you put the plan together, your editorial schedule, and those kinds of things. So with that, let me go to the next slide here. The good old days, right? Um, you know, in the good old days, we had uh, a limited number of outlets to get our message out, and it was really a broadcast kind of approach. You'd put something out there, people would see it, they would look at it, they would act or they wouldn't act. And it's a, a lot different world today. Uh, consumers have a megaphone. Your agency uh, will show up in a lot of different places. Information about your agency will show up in a lot of different places. But in the good old days, it was kind of a once-a-year thing. You did something like, you know, gave the yellow page reps some money. You put an ad in the phone book, and then that was kind of it. Then you went back to selling insurance. Um, things have changed where the yellow books are concerned. Four years ago, they were only half the size they were just four years before that, and they're probably half that size now. I'm not sure what it is. I couldn't find a statistic. And not only are the, the yellow books uh, dwindling in size, of course, people, fewer people are using them, and the people that are using them are kind of sort of segmenting themselves into tidy little demographics, basically uh, older and less educated. And that's fine if that's your target demographic, but if it's not, then obviously the yellow pages you know, really don't make sense. So if we can't just do that one and done, give the reps some money, show up in the phone book, sell insurance, if we can't do that, how do we get noticed today? And the reason we're doing this webinar and the other ones is because there are so many choices out there. Um, some of them are expensive, some of them are inexpensive, some of them will show results very quickly, some of them will show results only after you know, three or four months. So some of the traditional uh, ways you get noticed are still applicable, there's still a value to you know, telemarketing, direct mail, broadcast, those kinds of things, whether it's TV or radio, and God knows, you know, Geico and some of the other direct marketers see the value in that because they spend plenty of money on that. But there's all these digital things, search engine optimization, which we've heard about for years. Uh, we're going to spend more time talking about SEO um, in the context of the Green Growth webinar, which is webinar three, as well as social pay-per-click. Email marketing will fit into the next webinar. Content marketing, what is that? We're going to talk a little bit about that today. Reputation management, and on down the line. There's just all these different things you can do uh, to get noticed today. Right. What gets you noticed in particular? And it really is just, a, just one thing for the most part, content. Right. So in terms of social media, whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, or Google Plus, or whatever, the right content gets shared, it gets noticed, it gets spread around kind of on your behalf. Um, and also the right content will show up in search. Google has said this for years, if we want to just focus on SEO for a second, it's really about content. It's about relevant quality content, content that's relevant to what people are looking for, right? And then the other thing that gets you noticed is just frankly being present, being there. So we'll talk a little bit about your business NAP. You'll see it at the bottom of the screen there. NAP is 
um, an acronym for name, address, phone number. So your name, address, and phone number show up in a bunch of different places around the uh, the internet, the web. Uh, uh, that may be all. It may just be your basic business data, or it may be more than your business data. Maybe reviews and some other information about your agency services you provide. So sometimes just being there is what's important, right? Depending on what the channel is. Content marketing. Um, that's a term that's not new. You've probably heard it. Uh, I don't know that people really. And I don't mean insurance agents, I just mean people collectively really understand what content marketing is. Whether you look at Wikipedia or um, some other source, the, the, the definition kind of breaks down to this. It's the art of communicating to clients and prospects without selling, right? So obviously you want to sell, but it's not, there's not sales pitches when you communicate. You're communicating your value proposition, you're establishing your expertise, whatever it might be, through content that you share in different channels. And where customers are concerned, you want to turn those customers into evangelists. You want to get them out you know, referring people to you and uh, spreading the good news about your agency. So that's content marketing. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about kind of how to execute some content strategies as we, we go through this a little bit. All right, so we had a whole list of things a couple of pages before, but you know we we're not like um, just ridiculously well off. We don't have infinite budgets. We don't have uh, 48 hours in a day, so you know, we can't do everything. What makes most sense? So you really need to choose your spots, right? Before you just choose a tactic, before you choose where you're going to invest your time or money in, in terms of digital marketing. Who are you communicating to? Who's your target audience? Right. The more specific we can be with that, the better job we can do. Because if we know who they are, we know what their needs are, we know what their concerns are, um, we know we, so we have some idea about what they want to hear, we have some idea about what we're going to tell them, we have a much better idea how to reach them, and then we can kind of look at cost. And the last thing you want to look at when you, you pick out uh, a digital campaign is how am I going to tell if it's working? Right. So you have things like analytics for uh, email campaigns. You have analytic, analytics for your website. There are other things we can look at. We'll look at a few of those that might be new to you in the course of, um, of this webinar as well. Okay, so let's start with kind of a typical planning thing. We've got to get some new carpeting for the office and replace a couple of computers, and we've got people that have been clamoring for raises for a few years. So if we're going to do all of those things, we have to grow our revenue by 5% next year. That's top down. But to make that happen, what do we actually have to produce? How do we do that? Right. So I know this is going to be hard to see. I'm going to look at a couple of slides after this that are going to break this spreadsheet here down in bite-sized pieces where we can see it. Uh, and this is one of the things. We'll, we'll send you a, a link to download this Excel spreadsheet. And in it, you can just kind of plug in your numbers in the, uh, the red box, and it'll do some calculations for you. And basically, for this mock agency, 5% growth means they've got to produce 15% more sales than they did in the prior year. Right? And that's because what you end the year up with really isn't your baseline. Right? You may gain a little bit because some of your carriers may do some rate increases. Um, you may lose some business because people move or they, you know, their brother-in-law goes into insurance or your insurance company, you know, non-renews them or whatever. So there's, there's some attrition. This mock agency, we just plugged in 95% of the retention number. But you can see up in the, the red area, the numbers that are in there, you, you started with 1,000 total clients. Really what you keep is 950. So that's why you have to produce more than you had last year in order to, to just kind of grow that 5%, that 15% growth to get five. So where are the opportunities for this mock agency? Well, one area is within their own book of business. They've got 1.5 policies per account. Their revenue per account is $120 commission per account. Um, this is probably an example of a personalized book of business, but you could apply the same spreadsheet to your commercial lines book or whatever. And those are two numbers you're going to want to look at for your agency. So what is the revenue per account? Uh, and I don't know what, what's appropriate for you. It depends a lot on you know, what commissions are, what premiums and commissions are in your area for the products that you're selling, but also policies per account. 
1.5 if this is personalized is really pretty low, right? Um, and it depends on how you categorize personal insurance. You might put per individual life, you might put health in there, disability, but we have umbrella. Uh, we might separate out inland marine. It just depends on how you categorize it. But there's somewhere between you know 9 and 12 or 13 potential products relationships you could have with a client. 1.5 is pretty low. The average across the agency universe, actually the independent agency universe, is 1.4. Um, don't know what yours is, but that's really something to look at. And this this agency definitely has some growth opportunities there. So one of the things we want to look at with clients is how, what's our relationship like? How do we score? So this is a report card over on the right, um, something that's part of the Confluency Solutions website that you can send out, but it also goes out automatically. And we just it's a satisfaction survey. Right? How did we do? Um, What's the difference between an agency that gets D's and one that gets A's on these individual scores? And, and, and we've got, uh, I don't know, two or 3,000 of these that we've looked at over a period of time, different agencies. And the, the, the short answer is it's, it's contact with clients. The agencies that tend to get better grades just have more contact with their clients. It's just that simple. That's not a new thing. Um, for years, I think most of us have heard that it takes five to seven proactive contacts per year to sort of maximize customer value, right? Okay, so um, green growth. Is there some opportunity there? What happened last year? Maybe we don't know exactly where a business came from, but as I talk to agents, you know, they'll tell me something like, oh, 60% or 70% of our business came from referrals. Well, we know how many policies we wrote, so we just plug in the decimal or a percentage in the red box it'll give me an idea how many came from that source, how many came from some kind of uh, account development activities, something we did, you know, emails we sent to our clients or some kind of campaign, uh, how many came from search, as near as we can tell, um, and that's usually miscounted both up and down. We're going to look at a slide that will kind of illustrate that. Actually, several slides that will show us that. Where did it come from last year? And remember, we've got to do more than we did last year. So. Are we going to get more from these sources, or are we, are we going to get some uh, business from other sources? So that's the top down, bottom up, just to help us kind of zero in on at least, you know, do we do more customer development? Do we do some customer development? Do we, you know, do more um, uh, emphasis on green growth, right? So when it comes to green growth, and this is uh, this slide is something that uh, I added to this presentation because. Uh, few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, conversation with one of our client agents, they, they said, look, you know, we've done a survey over the last 30 days, and 80% of our business comes from the website. And we'll take that. That sounds great. But that's probably not exactly right, right? Your website has a role in almost everything. So we're not going to deny that. Part one of the role of your website is it should help you show up in organic search results. So that's when we think about search engine optimization, SEO, that's the organic, right? So if your website is engineered the right way, if you have the right elements, uh, the keywords are there in, in the right places, you have um, good URLs and you know, header text is there and all kind of thing, um, and you have good relevant content that changes, you're getting some backlinks, your website's doing its part there. The fact is there are 200 factors in Google's PageRank algorithm, so we're just kind of hitting the surface here. But if your website is well engineered and you've got good content, um, then it's doing at least part of its job. So let's look at kind of another view of that sort of part one. This is broken up. This is a page one search results for uh, Insurance Seattle, Washington. And up in the upper left, you'll notice that I've, I've labeled that pay P, uh, excuse me, PPC, pay-per-click. So those things are showing up there because there's an auction going on. Uh, Yellow Page City, Geico have bid on these keywords, and if we click on that, it'll cost them some money. They're not showing up there because of what they've done on their website or anything like that. They're just showing up there because they bid on those keywords. Down below that, kind of keeping in the same column, those are local search results. And people are showing up there because they have claim their Google Plus local page. They have made sure that their NAP data, that NAP stuff, is 
consistent across the ecosystem. They're doing a few other things in that area. So it has very little to do with your website. So that's the website doesn't really have a role in getting found when it comes to local. And then over on the right, I've got a box around the organic results. Those are mostly, in fact, they're all web pages, but they aren't all insurance agency or insurance business web pages. In particular, the one I'm pointing to um, is a page from a third-party review site, in this case, Yelp, for Northwest Insurance Group. And you could see other things in the search results, images, um, Google Plus posts from people that might be in your circles. It could be a whole variety of things. So the point I wanted to make here is it used to be all about what your web pages had on them and how they were engineered and where the keywords were and all that. And that's kind of all that showed up in search. And now Google is showing you all kinds of different content. So showing up isn't just about SEO. It's about a variety of things, and you have to make a choice. So here on this graphic, we've got some of those other things. You might be doing email marketing. That might drive people to your website. Pay-per-click was already there. SEO we've talked about. Um, a lot of the folks who end up on Geico's website do that because they hear Geico's broadcast ads, and they go back to Google and they type Geico in the search box. So they're not, even though it looks to Google like they're searching on keyword Geico, they're not really searching at all. They were led there through broadcast advertising. So the whole bunch of different things. The point is, and that going back to that 80% of our clients, you know, we, our, our new business came from the website. It came through the website, right? Depending on what you're doing, whether it's direct mail, I see the name. I'm probably going to end up on the website to learn a little bit more about you, more about what you're doing if I'm interested, right? But it isn't necessarily search. So your website does have a role. And the other role, um, the website is, once people get there, converting them to leads. So you want to you want to maximize that. Uh, it, it can be a challenge to measure the proportion of visitors that turn into leads. Um, typically, about two percent is is something that you'll see with financial service related websites, uh, where we have undertaken to measure that. And you have to look at phone calls. You have to look at you know um, forms that are filled out online and some other things to try and get at what the website, what search really did for you, what, uh, excuse me, what your website visitors conversion rate really is. Um, but we can do better, usually about two and a half to three percent. So you, in order to make that happen, you have to recognize what it is visitors want, what are they coming to your website for, and then use graphics and layout to make that obvious so they don't have to hunt around, and then use the right calls to action, that's what the CTA is, uh, use the right calls to action in the right places. So for instance, home page and product page, home page on the left, product page on the right. These pages have different jobs, right? They're, they're meant to do the same thing. So it's not just a, we, we're picking out colors and furniture because, you know, Baroque appeals to us more than, you know, modern or whatever. We're, there's a role. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this. This will come up once or twice more in the other webinars. Uh, but when we talk about SEO and your website, it has a job to do. It's kind of two parts, right? Becoming, showing up, being visible uh, where where you can be visible through SEO, but then also once people are on your website, getting them to convert into leads. Right? So that's the role of your website, right? So having said all that stuff, what do you do as an agency? What do you do for your agency? Do you concentrate in-house? Do you concentrate on developing your book of business? Or do you go outside and try to get you know more green growth? And that's what the tendency for everybody is to do that, right? Uh, the fact of the matter is you probably need to do both. The, the, the question is, what's the right mix? And that's going to vary for each of you on this call. Can't answer that for you. That's partly, you know, where the, again, the opportunity, the, the budget, available time, those kinds of things. Uh, but as you answer those questions, you'll start to choose your tactics accordingly. All right, so the other point I want to make over the next several slides is these things are not mutually exclusive. They're all interrelated, right? Happy, let's talk about happy clients and customer value. In the old days, you could measure things like policies per account or revenue per account. We looked at a couple of those, right? So if those numbers are high, we probably have happy customers. They stay with us longer, right? And they refer more people to us. And now there's a, another dimension 
there's these indirect referrals, reviews that your customers will place on third-party websites and what that does for you. Happy customers to give you good reviews, unhappy customers to give you bad reviews. You may not have a whole lot of reviews, but we're starting to see that kind of activity uh, increase quite a bit, almost exponentially over the last year or 18 months. So this goes back to that agency um, that was on the SERP, the search engine results page a few slides ago. Um, if I were to click through, I'd end up on their Yelp page, right? They had 14 reviews. And you, you look over on the left where I've got that like, long oval, 38 visits to their website were from this source that came from Yelp. Um, what this is not counting is the number of people who picked up the phone right from the Yelp page because they saw the agency's you know, phone number there and just called them. And that's probably doubling that number. And I, and I say that because this agency has told us they're getting between 50 and 75 leads per month from Yelp. And their analytics, which is where the left uh, panel comes from, seems to corroborate that because we're showing that 38 leads did come uh, through the website. I could go back and look further. I'm not going to dig into it here. It'll stretch this webinar out way too far. But one of the things we would look at with Yelp is how long do people stay on the website? What pages did they look at? Right. Um, the longer you stick around, the more things you look at, the more likely it is that that, that visitor turns into a lead. Those numbers for Yelp referrals are they're almost through the roof. They're very high. So that's a very productive source. Again, um, you don't get the reviews unless you, you kind of have developed your customer relationships. But then when you do that, that increases the leads from another source, the third-party review site. Okay, low-hanging fruit, whether it's in the green growth area or customer development area, what is that? Anything that's low-hanging fruit typically exhibits these characteristics. Doesn't cost as much. So you don't have to worry about getting your money back after you've made an investment, right? You can see the results pretty quickly, whether they're good, bad, or indifferent. You don't have to wait around a long time for them to happen. So then there's little risk to the return on investment, right? That's low-hanging fruit meets those kind of characteristics. One of those things that's low-hanging fruit is just making sure your NAP data is correct, making sure that you show up. Um, this agency here has, we're showing, what, 29 listing sources for local information, and 24 of them have errors. So that might be a problem if somebody ends up on Kudzu or Yelp or City Search or whatever. Maybe they call the wrong number. Uh, the other way this manifests itself as a problem is Google starts to wonder about this business. Do we have the confidence that this business really is here, that this is what they do, that this is their information? And so that lack of confidence results in a lower placement in the display and the Google local part of the search results. So this is kind of you know, a double-edged uh, sword, and it's, it's cutting this agency in two ways. Then they're not showing it up at all on four um, websites. This reputation management local uh, search optimization is something we've talked about, particularly local search optimization, for years. And we've had different services to address this. We've had a new one for the last, I don't even know, four months maybe. Um, and one of the things we've noticed over time, and it hasn't really changed, is almost every agency has some problems in that area. Pretty easy to fix, doesn't really cost anything, right? So it's, it's pretty low-hanging fruit, and it has a multiplicity of benefits. So it'll, it'll fix your listing where people might see you in Yellow Book, but it'll also help with your uh, visibility optimization with, say, Google Plus Local or uh, one of those uh, online search engines. So low-hanging fruit when it comes to content. Let's look at some examples. We can uh, look at a specific example for leveraging content uh, across different tactics, across different channels. And we'll kind of, in doing that, we'll kind of see the interconnected world of content. That the point with this stuff is where you have content, we want to get the most we can out of it, right? Content is work or content is money. So we really want to sort of minimize the effort of sharing that content and then maximize the benefit of it wherever we can. All right, some different content examples, blog posts, right? There are things that we provide um, to you through your website. We can uh, do custom blog posts. You may do some 
blog posting on your own. These are things that typically sit on your website. Could be text, could be a picture, could be video, could be a combination of those things. Once you have that, you can also share those posts, not, not verbatim, not word for word, but you can draw attention to those posts on social mediums like Facebook and LinkedIn, right? Uh, video itself is an example of content. So YouTube is the, the biggest video sharing um, platform, but there's also other ones like Vimeo and Vine. Presentation, so slide sets like this one will uh, can be shared through um, services like SlideShare. In fact, this one will be. Uh, once this is done, in about a day or so, it'll show up there. And then infographics are uh, great uh, content. They, they get shared a lot. You can produce your own using a simple tool like Canva. There are other uh, infographics that you can find through uh, websites that are out there. So those are um, just some different examples of infographics. How do you leverage content? So I'm going to use as an example a YouTube video. And one of the things, if you have a YouTube video, one of the things it does for you is it makes you visible within YouTube. Right? If I go searching for, you know, what do I need to know about EPLI insurance or what are my options for you know, health care, either the open enrollment coming up, what do I need to do? I, I may find, not may, I will find some videos on YouTube through that search function there. YouTube is the second largest search engine after Google. Um, it's also a Google property. And because it's a Google property, YouTube videos show up in the search results on Google itself. So there's a couple of benefits right there for the YouTube videos. Um, so you're getting some SEO boost. That's one leverage, right? You can take that video or blog post or whatever it is, and you can communicate. Easy for me to say. You can communicate directly with clients and prospects that are on your mailing list through email, right? You can send them, summarize it in the email, send them the links back to that, and kind of track what happens. You can add those posts or summaries of those posts with links back to the YouTube video or whatever it is on your Google Plus profile and, and LinkedIn. So there's four or five different things we can do with that YouTube video, and we're getting a lot of different benefits from just this one piece of content. That's the, that's the idea behind leverage. Right? And that's kind of really what content marketing is about. Now that you've got content that establishes something, your expertise, how you help people, what your value proposition is, you want to share that in as many different ways as possible. So the interconnected world, right? Five to seven value-added contacts per year with your customers leads to happier customers, right? So report cards with A's in it. It's kind of the center or top of the panel. Um, those folks are more likely to give you positive reviews because they're happy now. So over in the bottom right, that left box where it says Jacksonville Auto Insurance, that's an agency, if this is from their local search listing page in Google+, they have two reviews. The one on the right, J.P. Perry Insurance, has 24 reviews. What does that mean? If you look, it may be hard to see, but at the very bottom, right underneath the red follow box on the lower right, you see the agency on the left has received 21,951 views. The agency on the right, J.P. Perry, has received over 71,000 views, five times as many views. Now, not all of those views are going to result in a lead, a phone call, a visit to the website, but obviously the one with 70,000 views is going to get a lot more traffic and leads than the one that has just 21,000, right? So again, we go back kind of this whole circle, this interconnected world. You do something to communicate with your customers, the reviews, the views, and then you end up with more leads out of that. So you may be sitting there thinking, you know, what content? Um, the fact is you probably have a lot more content than you think you do. Your insurance companies probably are producing uh, content for you. They may or may not be doing a great job letting you know what's out there, but several of the carriers I know for a fact have some pretty good content, whether it's videos or just kind of blog post stuff or things you could use in emails if you just check with them, right? Past blog posts, things that are, are on your website and maybe have been there for a few years, doesn't have to be brand new if you're going to share it through email, if you're going to turn it into a you know, a slide set and put it on PowerPoint and then slide share or whatever. It doesn't have to be brand new. It just has to be relevant. And then, of course, your associations, the, the big I, CP, excuse me, not CPSU, CPCU, for example, right? ERMI, another one. 
And then you can receive newsletters from sources like Dig or Reddit or, or uh, LinkedIn or whatever and curate content that they provide through weekly or daily newsletters. Won't all be appropriate to what you want to communicate, but rather than have to go around looking for things, you can have uh, potential content delivered right to you. Right? So it's all there. You just need to decide you know, who, who you're going to communicate with, what, what channels, where's your content, right? what do they want to hear, what's the frequency. You just need a plan to do this. Right? So one of the things that we'll also send um, out to you with the email is this kind of just quick cheat sheet. So there's down the left column here, we've got some different tactics, right? What's the cost in the second column? And that's on a relative basis, low, medium, high, right? Um, who are you communicating with if you're using SEO, pay-per-click, email marketing, right? So we've got personal clients, commercial clients, personal prospects, commercial prospects, or everybody, right? What's the time horizon? How long is it going to take before you start to see some evidence whether there's results or not? And then what's the ROI risk? And then a, you know, a couple of comments there. So as you're thinking about who do I need to, you know, what, what tactics do I need to use, there's a, just kind of a quick reference of what am I getting into, right, on this cheat sheet. Right, so where will the growth come from? One of the things we really didn't talk about when we talk about customer development, there's segments within your book of business. Certainly personal lines, commercial lines, that's a pretty easy one. Within commercial lines, there may be niches, so you have contractors, you have uh, I don't, municipalities, whatever, that you communicate with differently. Small business owners, right, communicate with differently. Within your personalized book of business, um, we may want to capture, and I hear this a lot, and this is kind of an issue for our the independent agency universe, is we want to get more younger clients. So that's a segment we want to develop. And what you communicate to them is going to be different than what you communicate to you know, mature drivers or retirees, who may be a target for you as well. But we want to ultimately segment that a little bit more granularly than just personalized commercial lines. We'll talk about that a little bit more on the next webinar. Um, you want to make sure you get a look at your NAP data. Is it pretty clean? Is it all screwed up? Do we need to fix it a little bit? Right? You need to get a look at your reputation. What are people saying about you? Um, and where you can, you want to get your clients saying nice things about you. Um, make them happy is one element of that. The other one is just make it easy for them to, to, to do reviews and give you referrals. Again, we'll talk more about that in the next webinars. But once you've kind of you know decided where this is going to come from, you've looked at some of these basic elements, it starts to get a lot easier to, to choose the channel for your content especially once you have an idea of you know, what the ROI risk is. And then you just you can identify the right content from there. And once you've done that, you're going to need something like this for each channel that you're going to communicate through. So what this is is an editorial schedule for email marketing campaign, right? So what's the campaign? We just have some shorthand in here. Um, so I'll tell you up here on the upper left, PCN is personal, personal customer nurture. So we're going to send some emails to our customers. We've identified those at the beginning of the year. We know what the content is. They're personalized clients, safety, money saving, community information, whatever, right? When are we going to send it? We'll send it on the 19th. We're going to send it to our personalized customers, right? Uh, commercialized customers, the CCN is commercial customer nurture. They're going to get something on a different date, and that's it, right? February, we're going to send a flood email to everybody, and that's it. Personal commercial is going to get that, and so on and so forth. So I can identify at, at once a year, wh who am I going to send stuff to through this channel? What's the content, right? And whether, again, maybe we keep that in-house, do that as an agency. Maybe you have Confluency do this for you, or maybe you have another vendor. But the point is, does this make sense for you? Is this something that needs to be an element of your digital marketing plan? Same thing with social media. Same thing with you know, any, any of the other channels you're going to communicate through. Um, who are we going to communicate with? What's the content? What do they want to hear? What's the frequency? You can put uh, probably a simpler schedule than this together for most of the other channels. Okay. So that's kind of an overview um, of what the elements are for digital marketing plan. Hopefully it's 
kind of made you think a little bit about um, how you choose which tactics uh, you're going to use. Again, as a reminder, we'll send an email out to you that will have the resources, the cheat sheet in it, the Excel file, the Excel um, spreadsheet so that you can kind of work through some of the numbers for yourself uh, if you don't have anything like that now. Webinar 2, there will be the link to sign up for that. Uh, webinar 3 and 4, as we figure those out, we will um, get that information out to you as well. And with that, um, if you have any questions or comments or whatever, uh, Ken and I will hang around here for a little while. Um, you do have uh, our contact information here, and again, it will be in the email. So a day from now, a week from now, a month from now, if you have some questions or looking for a little bit of help with something, uh, feel free to let us know. We'll do what we can. But I. Uh, Appreciate everybody taking time out. Um, this is this is pretty important stuff. To so I'm, I'm glad to see that level of attendance is what it is, and and I, I do hope you found it to be helpful. But again, we're going to stick around a little bit. So I'm going to tell some jokes or something, and uh, kill a few minutes here. You've got the go to meeting panel with the the chat box on there. So if you have any questions or comments. Um, go ahead and post and um, we will uh, answer those as best we can. If there are any questions there and you uh, leave now or in the next few minutes, uh, we'll post the questions and answers in the email we send out as well. Nothing yet? We'll give it a few more minutes. but I'm going to stop the recording at this point.